the pandemic has resulted in schools shut all over the world. As a result, education has changed dramatically with the distinctive trend of e-learning, whereby teaching is undertaken remotely and on digital platforms. We are concerned on how this has created an impact on the education with hearing impairment from the experts in the rehabilitation. We discussed with an invocation to seek the blessings of the Almighty. The invocation is rendered by the students of Dr. Angel Home and Higher Secondary School for the speech and hearing impaired. Now may I request Dr. Lata Rajendran, Principal, Dr. Injur Institute of Special Education and Research, to deliver the welcome address. Vanakkam. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you all for the 28th Founders Day webinar on online teaching and training to school-aged children with hearing impairment, organized to commemorate the 104th birth anniversary of our founder, Dr. MGR, whose vision and dream was education, empowerment, and inclusion of persons with speech and hearing impairment, for which we are working towards for the past three decades. Great men live through their words and deeds, and we cherish their memories and reconnect with their uh, spirits to honor them through our gratitude. I must begin with a few words about MGR and our institution. Dr. MGR was the first popular film star to be a chief minister in India. He is most remembered for his philanthropic nature and his popularity continues to last decades past his life. Once he became the chief minister of Tamil Nadu, he placed great emphasis on social development, especially through education. Unfortunately, he suffered a stroke in 1984, and his speech was affected. Following that, he bequeathed his uh, home to be made into an institution for the rehabilitation of children with speech and hearing impairment. Hence, our institute, Dr. MGR Home, was established on 17th January 1990. In the past three decades, more than 2,000 hearing impaired children have benefited from the education and rehabilitation services provided by this institution. Here, we also provide training in learning skills like uh, training, uh, tailoring, baking, drawing, painting, computer applications, martial arts, etc., that will help them explore their potentials. Most of our students have become graduates and postgraduates and are well integrated into society and are leading independent and meaningful lives. In the Dr. MGR Janaki College for Women, we integrate 20 to 30 young women with hearing impairment every year. Dr. MGR Institute for Special Education was established offering B.Ed. Special Education to, training, to train teachers to teach the, uh, children with hearing impairment. Every step taken towards the realization of the noble vision of Dr. Bharat Ratna, Dr. M.G. Ramachandran is deeply gratifying. Every year we celebrate his birthday um, by organizing a seminar on a topic based on welfare of persons with special needs. Today, this webinar. I extend a hearty welcome to all the esteemed speakers, distinguished delegates and well-wishers faculty, students, parents, friends from the media who are participating in this webinar. A very warm welcome to Dr. Suni Matthew, Director, Alin, um, Aliwajang National Institute for the Speech and Hearing um, Disability, Mumbai, who has kindly consented to inaugurate this webinar. Professor Christine Yashinago Itano, Research Professor, University of Colorado, is with us today. She has graciously, graciously accepted to deliver the keynote address. 
I extend a warm welcome to you, ma'am. I'm indeed happy to welcome Dr. Anita Jilka, Professor, Department of uh, Education of Groups with Special Needs, NCRT New Delhi, who has kindly consented to deliver the key, uh, special address. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Varsha Gattu, Head of the Department of Education, AYJNISHT Mumbai, who has agreed to speak to us about online language development for children with hearing impairment. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Jayshri Shanbal, Associate Professor in Language Pathology and Head Telecenter uh, tele for Persons with Communication Disorders, All India Institute of Speech and Hearing, Mysore, and uh, Ms. Mamta, Assistant Professor in Audiology from All India Institute, uh, for speech and hearing, Mysore, who have uh, accepted to share their knowledge on key areas related to online speech therapy and auditory training, respectively, to children with hearing impairment. I'm very happy to welcome Professor R. Rangasai, former director, Aliu Ajang National Institute for Speech and Hearing Disability, Mumbai, who has always supported and guided us in all our activities and who has been instrumental in making us follow a tradition of organizing a seminar every year on the Founders' Day for the past 28 years. He has uh, graciously come forward to summarize the proceedings and present the recommendations. I welcome you, sir. I welcome you all once again. As an after effect of the COVID-19 lockdown, face-to-face -face classroom teaching continues to be risky and online classes are becoming the new normal. The digital platform has primarily helped overcome the distance divide and remote teaching has reached remote corners. The emergency of the pandemic has compelled a quick transition to and in technology with a swift swiftness that seems incredible. Suddenly all users online are ready to cope and adapt to change and evolve at the speed that necessity demands. While teachers have, of educational institutions have geared themselves up with technical knowledge required for transacting on these platforms, it can be also seen as a boon for children with special needs in situations that do not permit them to access real classrooms. As we gradually open up, we need to work out ways and means of using the e-learning platform, especially online pedagogy and teaching for the larger good, especially um, for children with special needs, both in special schools or in, in the inclusive setup, or for those who are not able to commute to school. What initially seemed to be a challenge is now automatically uh, turning advantages as we increasingly see it positively. In the more post-pandemic era, it becomes obvious that technology will play a great role even in a traditional classroom setup, breaking the boundaries of a school and connecting them inclusively, especially in the context of the new education policy 2020. This webinar on online education and teaching for school age children with hearing impairment will focus on the strategies and challenges in online training of children with hearing impairment. We hope that the participants benefit from the deliberations. Thank you all once again. Welcome you all once again. Thank you. I deem it an honor to introduce Dr. Suni Matthew, Director, Ali Avar Jung National Institute of Speech and Hearing Disabilities, Mumbai a general come special educator by qualification and a master trainer by profession. Dr. Sunim Matthew holds double masters and a doctoral degree and is currently working as a director, Ali Avarjung National Institute of Speech and Hearing Disabilities, Divya Gyan, uh, Mumbai. In her career spanning around 24 years, Dr. Matthew has worked mainly in the area of uh, human resource development for rehabilitation of deaf and hard of hearing. Dr. Suni Matthew is a university recognized guide for MED special education, that is for the hearing impaired, and PhD special education programs. Her area of specialization includes special and mainstream education, 
educational evaluation, subject teaching, instructional planning, research, etc. She has contributed to the development of a standardized test battery, test of school readiness for the deaf and the hard of hearing. She has several national and international publications to her credit and has demonstrated her subject expertise as a unique writer, editor, etc. in the development of training materials nationally and internationally. She has presented papers at national and international levels and has received the Best Researchers Award of NCED India in 2009. She has contributed to various academic committees of the Ministry, Central Universities, University of Mumbai and Rehabilitation Council of India, that is RCI. As a part of the leading national institute, its four regional centers and three composite regional centers, Dr. Matthew is licensing with the Department of Empowerment of Personal Persons with Disabilities, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment and Maharashtra State in planning and implementing and evaluating various programs for PWDs, their families, rehabilitation professionals and others. Recently, she has been felicitated by the government of Maharashtra as a COVID warrior recognizing the services offered to PWDs during this pandemic. Madam, it's an honor to have you here today on this occasion. I request you to kindly take over. <clears throat> Very good morning to all the, uh, the senior, my teachers and my colleague teachers. It is indeed uh, a great pleasure for me to be a part of this uh, webinar. Uh, for many reasons. One is, it's again, once again, a get together to see all my teachers, my fellow professionals, you know, who are sincerely working for the education of uh, children with hearing loss particularly. Second is, obviously, during this pandemic, we have been interested with several additional responsibilities for which it is very essential for us to come together as a single team and plan out what is best possible for uh, we can offer to our children with disability. So this is a second thing which I really thought of it. And I also thought it will be a great learning experience for me to listen to my colleagues on different perspectives, particularly with the online education. I think uh, from March onwards, I think all of us have gone through a, a, a different uh, a, a set of challenges, whether at the professional friend or at the personal friend. Particularly, COVID has given us, you know, high and dry on what to do, like how we are going to handle the quality of education or sorry, the education, you know, um, transfer of education or support to our children. The first and the foremost we as teachers need to know is we are the maker or the breaker for a child's life. So whatever the challenges we are going to face, I feel we are beyond these challenges because we as teachers have solution for everything. I don't think that we require uh, somebody's expertise or somebody's uh, uh, you know, advice for developing or developing strategies for dealing with children with health disabilities. But obviously, worldwide education has recognized online education as the new strategy or the new platform for, you know, future education. Uh, very often when you are going to analyze uh, the education, the 21st century curricular demands remains the same. The curricular part or the pedagogy part also remain the same. The most, the, the foremost thing what we need to look at is how are we going to offer the education? 100% I think you all will agree with me that this COVID pandemic, particularly children at home and offering education through an on, online platform has impacted us in, in a negative manner to some extent. Because I personally know that even I have a daughter who is going for the online education. Many children, I can see at least in the field of special education, we are lucky. In mainstream education, you can see children logging in and they switch off the videos, gone. Then, you know, poor teachers are struggling, you know, they keep on asking questions, but no response from them. And any time we ask them, they will say there is an internet connectivity problem. But obviously, for our children with special education, online education is going to be a little bit more difficult because first of all, they need to be trained 
how to utilize the internet and how to utilize your uh, gadgets for you know for the online education first and foremost i always tell the teachers is to train the parents number one the ethics in online education because many a times when you offer a laptop or a mobile to a child he may be busy with taking up some you know games or maybe some other part which interests them more many children may not because they know that there is no personalized attention at this juncture the teacher is not going to you know look at him the teacher is not going to give a direct you know uh, uh, feedback to the child so first and foremost in any online education i feel you need to have the consensus of the parents as to what all things we need to do it how many hours we need to offer them for this online education apart from our regular education number one second is what content we need to explore because you may be wondering why i am focusing on parents because once the parents are very clear with what are we doing it what type of input we are looking out what type of a support we are offering from the we are expecting from the parents i think the teachers work becomes far more easier and we can bring good um, in I mean educational support you know for these children so once parents are prepared for it the second part is teachers preparedness first and the foremost thing i always look at from a teacher is to have a positive attitude towards it because i'm very sorry to say that there is a good percentage of teachers who are not at well versed with online lesson plannings online delivery of content online you know um, uh, researching out the good materials you know how to put their presentations because many a times you can see teachers just copy paste you know the content and again presenting it to the children on an online platform and already uh, in special education what is my uh, botheration is already we have lot of adaptations and adoptions plus cutting down you know the the censoring or what i can i used to days laugh it and say of uh, cutting down the content but online education should not you, you know uh, further support such a uh, type of cutting down the content we as teachers need to be very clear as to what exactly the content has to be given in what manner that is very important no further cutting down of the content because i have observed and i have experienced that teachers remove they will say examination ke liye what is coming that much they teach in part like in peace meals which will have a major negative impact on the child than you know having a, a you know we claim so our claims will not be successful if we are going to do any any uh, alterations or cutting down of the content the other part of it you should you as teachers you utilize online education as a good platform because today you have lot of videos which are available in the internet for teaching you know these subjects i have seen today like for example generation of electricity i think we all have studied it only through you know verbal you know the teachers used to explain this is the way the uh, electricity is generated but today you see you have lot of videos on that how the electricity is generated utilize those resources there are very good platforms which people are you know offering the content you know delivery how that topic can be taught so we as teachers it's very important to utilize such platforms explore those possibilities and utilize those uh, resources you know in our teaching in fact online teaching is going to give you more opportunity to utilize more resources in an online manner which is also very essential for teachers but it is obviously the teachers uh, curiosity and the way you are going to look at you know imparting the education that way it will be a, a good thing you know if you utilize on that second part which i always say is that the time lag that the time span that you are going for the online education because always remember of the psychological um, benefits or psychology uh, behind the learning part the 
too much of online education will not be there wherever possible you can have some individualized wherever possible you can have some group lessons so you know like what is happening is then the child will totally feel that you know have that feeling as the yes my teacher is with me maybe you may be taking eight children in a group but for example for your individualized education for your remedial education you can have one to one even if it is 10 minutes even if it is a 5 minute session with the child it will have a lot of impact on that particular child so that is why i always feel it is the total there is no standard procedure or there is no standard methodology for an online education it is totally tailor made by the teachers based on the curriculum that is of mean given to you and based on the the strengths and weaknesses of the children that you are going to <laughs> remember that not all children will benefit from the online education so or as principal as teachers you need to devise some alternative options for this children if we are planning to do in that way and a regular follow up with the parents that is what i said online education without parents is absolutely a big zero for all of us the 100 percentage you need to take the parents in your hand before you proceed for the online education because many a times now what is happening is you have to understand that the persons with uh, the children with the disabilities even there is a good group who does not have you know the the gadgets in their place how many people can afford a laptop at their home and very i mean very recently you know i was um, with one of the um, state government discussions on offering you know the tabs for the persons with the disabilities so you know like when we were recommending you know they they were all the time telling you know like you know this is the expenditure but i was just telling one side we are promoting online education for children with disabilities other side the infrastructure is not enough for us look at the the schools how many of you have a speed internet even today at ali version we are also at the mercy of google meet we do not have an internet facility my teach you look at the how many teachers will can you know have a good internet facility to offer uninterrupted uh, educational support for our children so there is a another part is coming is your school may not even if you may not have that number of, that much of financial resources also with you you should explore the csr support for either for the gadgets for the needy children obviously for the internet support or the other resources and i always recommend you that each teacher of a special school should have a collaboration with a general school or a mainstream school and you can share your resources to each other so it becomes more easy for us to you know to develop a good balanced uh, online curriculum and an online education practice because alone i think no it will be a very difficult challenge for teachers because then teachers will tend to come to the class directly online they will speak and they will go away they will do their duty but a meaningful interaction will not take place in that so i request not only the mgr school all the participants uh, parent institutions to look forward for options of collaboration whether with the mainstream school whether with the organizations for support because you know it that many of the government schools and like private schools is going through a lot of financial crisis the budget has been drastically reduced we are not in a position to afford you know the cost of many uh, many many uh, under many many heads so in such cases only the goodwill of the of the you know the well wishers of our institutions may be tapped and then we should utilize it in a much better way and uh, if that way if we are going to offer our online education and i am very sure that whatever the dreams that we have holding it in our minds will come true so uh, with a request that ultimately i i give it the online education can be successful only if the teachers willingly take it up not as a duty as a commitment as a professional you know uh, uh, support to my children with 
lot of support from our outside agencies if together obviously we can succeed and that is what i look forward from each one of you and i am very sure that in today's uh, webinar we have good resource persons who are going to look at the pros and cons of online education and how we can enhance the quality of online education so i am very sure that uh, on this day we are going to have a good uh, you know guidance from our mentors who will help us in planning out a good online education for our children i hope that we will obviously overcome this pandemic and we will come as successful warriors and particularly in uh, empowering our children and ensure that quality should not be compromised at the cost of this pandemic that is the only thing which i wanted to submit to all of you and wish all the best to uh, all the participants and to the primary organization of mgr and uh, my pranam to uh, dr mgr and his family for the wonderful contribution to this nation and we the family of rehabilitation professionals the parents and children with disabilities uh, pay our homage to our founder dr mgr for his support and this thing he lives in our mind and i am very sure that he is alive even today you know in all our mind in true spirit thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, and particularly my thanks to lata ma'am for this uh, wonderful uh, organization of this so i i, I see or i can share that this is formally inaugurated to your platform for learning thank you so much thank you very much madam for inaugurating the webinar and for your very inspiring message to all the teachers and special educators thank, thank you, you very much madam uh, it is an honor for all of us to have today with us dr christine yoshina pitano to deliver the keynote address may i uh, may i now uh, introduce uh, dr christine yoshina pitano she is the professor emerita department of speech language and hearing sciences and research professor at the institute of cognitive science at the university of colorado boulder she is a visiting professor at the university of witwatersrand south africa center for deaf she has received research funding from the national institutes of health centers for disease control maternal and child health the office of special education office of education and national institute on disability independent living and rehabilitation research since the early 1980s to study predictors of language social emotional cognitive and auditory outcomes of infants and children who are deaf or hard of hearing we are extremely happy to have you with us today ma'am may i request professor yoshina gaitano to take over please madam thank you very much i will try now to see if i can share my screen Ma'am, would she have your presentation? Yes, Ma now we're presenting. Is this oh. uh, available to everybody now on the screen? Yes, Ma'am. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, um, yes, can, 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 presentation. You are able to see it. Okay, so. Um, the research that I'm going to present today is um, on research done in the United States, in the state of Colorado, on the impact of race, ethnicity, education, and poverty on the literacy outcomes of children who are deaf and hard, hard of hearing. And these are children between the ages of third through 10th grade. So that would be approximately eight years of age to about 16, 17 years of age. I'm gonna start first because I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, the topic that you have started um, discussing about how to do better online training. And this particular study is on school-aged children, but it's much younger children, starting from infancy. Um, and the outcome that we measured was pragmatic language development, which is conversational, abstract language um, competence. So the, 
the pragmatic language skills are some of the highest area of language uh, functioning for school age children. Um, when you have deficits in this area, it's usually associated with behavior problems and low literacy skills. And children who are deaf and hard of hearing have demonstrated significant delays in this critical area of language. Um, if you would like, we do have an assessment that we use. This assessment is used up to the age of seven, so this is younger children than uh, secondary school. But we have found that children who are late identified have uh, problems with pragmatic language even um, in older ages. Now, the pragmatic language skills um, that were measured can are predicted by some uh, variables that are um, pretty much expected by uh, most of you, and that would be that uh, children with higher intelligence quotients have higher pragmatic language. Children who have more hearing have um, higher pragmatic language. And children whose mothers have a higher level of education typically also have higher pragmatic language skills. Now, one of the biggest predictors of higher levels of language level, um, and again, we're looking at predicting language at the age of seven years, in the United States is predicted by whether or not the children have met um, EDI 136. Now, we have rolled out universal newborn hearing screening across the United States. So this means that the children were screened by one month of age. They were identified by hearing loss by three months of age. And they were in parent-centered early intervention by six months of age. Now, I know that... Um, Universal newborn hearing screening is not available all over um, India, but I, it's my understanding that there are definitely some hospitals that are screening. So I'm assuming that you are getting some, uh, not not at the secondary level, but but in the parent infant programs, that there are children who are being earlier and earlier identified. What I wanted to point out here is that one of the strongest predictors of higher level language, even in the early years, is the greater quantity of parent talk. And um, that's exactly what parent-centered early intervention does. It teaches parent strategies for conversations. And I'm going to talk about how this is related to the school age population. So what can parents, teachers do, especially in the time of COVID-19? Um, and one of the most important things is to teach the importance of parent parental conversational turn-taking. So it's not just how much they talk to their children, but it's also how much when they talk to their children, their children talk back to them. Now, the relationship with school-age children or older children is that there is a switch in early elementary school when the uh, importance of parent to child talk diminishes and it's taken over by peer to peer conversational turn taking. It turns out that um, children when they get older are highly motivated to be understood by their peers. They work harder at their speech production, they work harder at their um, the syntax and grammar of the sentences that they say. So one of the things that children can do when they're at home with COVID is to talk with their peers. Um, now, preferably, I, I mean, I think it's more motivating if they can do it on um, platforms like um, WhatsApp or Zoom calls. But if they don't have that, even telephone um, conversations are helpful in promoting language development for older children. Now, I want to just talk to you about why uh, parental conversational turns are so important and why peer-to-peer, children-to-children conversations are so important. There's a technology that's been available that can readily assess parent word frequency. Um, and the how much a parent talks to their child, at least in the United States, and this has been replicated in many, many countries around the world, is related to how much education the mother has. Now, one of the most um, recent studies has been that uh, the Lena Foundation has uh, published this study in 
2018 that show that the amount of conversations that occur um, in the first four years of life pre predict the child's verbal IQ scores and predict their reading and also their language levels at 12 years of age. Now, this is in typically developing children. Now, one of the exciting things that's coming out of the literature is that the conversational turns also predict brain activity in the language centers. These are just some references that uh, you can look at the PowerPoint later that come from the Harvard um, Language Lab. Now, this just shows you in this picture that the number of conversational turns between a parent and child is predicting activation in the language areas of the brain where you can see right here um, in the yellow area. And that directly predicts the composite language score of the child. But you'll see also that just by itself, outside of the activation of the brain language centers in the brain, conversational turns also directly predicts the uh, language score of school-age children. So why is that happening? It's because the amount of language that a child is exposed to affects their brain processing speed. And the brain processing speed in turn drives um, vocabulary acquisition. So the studies are showing that the, both the, this purple area and the um, aqua or blue-green area right here um, are the, the language areas of, of the brain and they are what is activated when children are in conversations with their parents and although the research hasn't yet been done with peer-to-peer -peer conversations um, I think it's very reasonable to assume that the same thing happens when children have more and more conversations with one another. Now this is why the brain of the very young child is so important because in the first three years what you see here is that um, the the neurons in the newborn are not that many, but by the time the child is six months of age, you can see how the neural connections have expanded dramatically. And by two years of age, there are millions of neural co connections uh, that have uh, expanded within the young child's brain. And that is one of the reasons why parental conversations in the very, very early years of age with all children, both children with typical development and children who are deaf and hard of hearing is so important. Now, this is the Lena technology. It's a talk pedometer. It measures how much talking the child is exposed to. This is a vest. Inside the vest is a little pocket where this blue arrow is pointing to. There's a Velcro um, pocket and you put this little recorder into the pocket after it's turned on and you leave it for 10 to 16 hours. Um, it, it can be accessed and processed through the cell phone sending it to the cloud, which is what we do, um, either through a computer or a cell phone or an um, iPad. Um, and this is what it measures. It gives you the number of adult words that are spoken to the child um, in a 10 to 16 hour day. How many conversational turns um, are occur between um, the parent and the child, um, how many vocalizations the child uses during the 10 to 16 hour day. And for deaf and hard of hearing children, this it also gives you a rating of the auditory environment. What percentage of the day was meaningful conversation in dis where they were conversing with the child, but there was distant speech, where there was overlapping speech, meaning that Several people were talking at the same time while the child is trying to listen to a primary speaker, um, whether there's noise in the background, whether there's TV or electronic noise, and how much silence there is in the background. These are what the reports look like. On the left-hand side is the daily word count. Um, you can see that it does words, conversational turns, and child vocalizations. On the right side are the hourly breakdowns. So you can see very quickly that at 6 p.m. Um, that that was the time when the parents were talking the most. It was also the time when the child was conversing the most. And I just 
The other score that's very important is what's called an AVA standard score. It matches the child's vocal production to the adult model, and it's a measure of the complexity of a child's speech. The other um, measure is a vocal productivity standard score. It measures the syllables per utterance, and it can be used in any language in the world. It's a duration measure of syllables within the child's utterances, and it is a screening for the child's grammar and morphine production in their spoken language. So um, the mean length of utterance was designed for English, but um, is not as useful in other spoken languages. Um, syllables per utterance are, is a much more um, usable uh, screening tool for other languages that are not English. Um, you can also manually run an autism screen, which we have done to um, help us in early identifying autism as a secondary disorder in our deaf and hard of hearing population. So what you see here at the top is the audio environment measure. The green is the amount of meaningful language. The orange is overlapping speech. The blue is distance speech. The, ye the yellow is TV and electronic. The red is the noise, and you can see in this one there's not a bit, there's not very much noise in this environment. Um, but look at the amount of silence, and this happens to be an almost two-year-old child, so that's quite a bit of silence. That uh, for a deaf and hard of hearing child, we would want there to be more language conversation uh, during the day. Um, this is the AVA score or the complexity of the child's language. We only become worried if we have um, the scores below this red line, so it's used as a screening device. This is the syllables per utterance, and again, we only become concerned when we see repeated um, scores that are below the red line. Um, and again, this is though this device is predominantly used for our early um, children, our children who are before school age or early elementary. What I'm going to talk to you now is how all of that early work relates to what happens in the school age period. So I'm going to talk about the uh, longitudinal reading proficiency for our children from third through tenth grade after we began establishing universal newborn hearing screening in the state. So this particular um, school district is one of the largest school districts in the state. It's also the most diverse, and it also has the highest level of poverty, one of the highest levels of poverty of any of the school districts in the state of Colorado. 71% of the children identify as racial ethnic minority. And in the United States, that means that they are identifying either as African American or Black, Hispanic, Latino, um, or and or Asian um, would be um, classified as an ethnic minority. This district also has an extremely high percentage of children who do not speak English in the home. Uh, the primary language uh, for children who don't speak English in the home is Spanish, but this particular district has about 30 or 40 different languages that are spoken in the homes of children who live in this school district. Now, the, the most um, unusual characteristic about this school district is that it has a very high poverty rate. 71% of the population that I'm going to show you their, their reading results are qualify for what we call free and reduced lunch, which means that the government has decided that the family's income level is not sufficient for the child to be provided the nutrition that they need to be, be learning in a um, regular education system. So the children are provided both breakfast and lunch during the school day. And 71% is a very, very large percentage. Now in the state of Colorado, um, we started universal newborn hearing screening in the year 1992 with only two hospitals. Now our population is so small compared to any of your cities in uh, India. We uh, 
in the entire state, we have about 5.3 million uh, people living here and about 70,000 births per year. So in 1992, we had only two hospitals that had begun screening for newborn hearing screening. So there were maybe a couple of thousand children who were screened that year. And you can see at even up to 1997, we had fewer than 20% of our population screened. By 1998, we were above 40%. 1999, we were at 50%. Then legislation was passed in our state to mandate um, universal newborn hearing screening. And you can see that in the next year, many, if not most, of the hospitals began universal newborn hearing screening. We were just beneath 90 percent and then shortly after that you can see that we're very very close to 100 percent about 97 to 98 percent of the children um, were screened between the, uh, the years 2001 and 2006. now these are birth years and i want to talk about those birth years because i'm going to the children who are tested are again 8 to 16 years of age so their birth years are um, considerably before the the age of the reading test the other population characteristic that's important in this population is that since most of these children uh, by the time we had stopped collecting the reading data um, had been screened at birth, which means that the deaf and hard of hearing children, about 80% of them um, had been screened by one month, identified by three months, and in early intervention by six months. So this was a very, as the, as the children, as the year of testing increased, more and more children had been screened um, at birth. So the first cohort was measured in the year 2000. And in the year 2000, there were no children in this district or uh, if that were identified through universal newborn hearing screening. Every year after the year 2000, one birth court was cohort was added and they would have been the third graders. So in 2001, when they tested, the third graders um, would have been um, screened at birth. The, the next year, in 2002, the third and fourth graders would be screened. In, in 2003, the third, fourth, and fifth graders, until we get to 2013 and 2014. The other thing that happened was because the language levels and the reading levels improved as we implemented universal newborn hearing screening, in the year 2000, only 17 deaf and hard of hearing children were eligible to take the regular reading test for hearing children because their language levels were high enough. All of the other children, uh, it's approximately 150 deaf children in this particular district, were exempted because of their language levels were too low. Now, by the time we got to 2013, for 2014, very few of our school-aged children now are exempted. Now you see that instead of only 17 children taking the test, we're now up to 165 to 171 children taking the test. So this is the general results of that reading. And what you should look at is the different colors. The green represents the change over time of the percent of children who are deaf and hard of hearing who had uh, proficient or advanced reading scores as compared to their normally hearing peers in English, right? So no matter what home language they had, they, had, they took this test in English. And what you'll see here is that there was only one child out of 17 that was in this group. And with each new birth cohort of children who were screened early, you can see that the percentage of proficient reading increased until we get down to the year 2000, 2014. And now we are um, about 37% of the children are at or above age level when compared to their normally hearing peers. Now, there's another um, group in here that's called partially proficient. That's the yellow 
group. Um, these are children that are a little bit delayed, but that um, one of the things that we found is that with each grade, new grade, the children became more and more proficient. But if you add up the green and the yellow, what you'll see is that 70% of the children were partially proficient proficient or advanced in their reading. And now instead of 80% being unsatisfactory, the pink bars, right? Now by 2000, 2014, um, about 30% of the children were unsatisfactory. Now what the most remarkable thing about this particular cohort is, remember that this is a very at risk cohort. This is not um, a cohort with um, socioeconomic privilege. And um, that makes these results even more um, surprising and um, exciting. So what happened over time is that the prof partially proficient, proficient and advanced moved from 18.8% to 68.5% between 2000 and 2013. Unsatisfactory decreased from 81.3% to 31.5%. And you can see that the proficient advanced increased from 6.3% to 37%. Now, all of the children made gains based on the rollout of universal newborn hearing. They also made gains every year they were in school. So they're the third graders had the most children who were behind. And as they got up to the 10th grade, there were fewer and fewer children who were delayed in their reading proficiency. Um, now, when you're talking about free and reduced lunch, these are the children who have some issues with poverty, right? The, the um, uns, I'm sorry, these are the children who did not, they were not eligible for free and reduced lunch. So these are the children who were not in poverty. And when we look at just that 30% of the population that were not in poverty, unsatisfactory reduced from 75% to 4.5%. There were almost no unsatisfactory children as long as the families weren't experiencing any poverty. Now that is an amazing uh, finding. And the proficiency advanced rate increased from 0% in 2000 to 70.5% by 2013, 2014. The increases were significantly less when the children, um, families um, were eligible for free and reduced lunch, meaning that they were experiencing poverty. But even in the free and reduced lunch eligible group, they increased with each birth year. They increased with each grade level. But you can see that the increases were not as dramatic, but they were still highly significant. So the unsatisfactory decreased from 83% to 41%. The proficient advanced increased from 8% to, to 25%, or about 25%. So there was an increase. It just was not um, as great as the children who were not experiencing poverty. Now, we had a cohort in this group who were uh, non-English speaking. Um, these were children, um, and in fact, remember that in this district, 38% of the deaf and hard of hearing children um, lived in homes in which their parents did not speak English. Um, the amazing thing about the, co the comparisons between the English speaking and the non English speaking children again, the reading tests were given in English. There was no significant difference indicating that the gains in each group were comparable. And this finding is truly exciting because um, there is a, a greater poverty in the children who are non English speaking. But the fact that they made gains every year, and they were not significantly different. Once we accounted for poverty, they were not significantly different from the English-speaking group. Um, it's very exciting. Um, in the United States, because of universal newborn hearing screening, we always do the parent-centered early intervention in home language, and we don't introduce English in, 
to those children until they're some between three and five years of age. So English is a second language, but we, but by the time they're five years of age, it becomes the dominant language, um, even when they're still speaking um, their native language in the home. Now, there is a higher percentage of children from non-English speaking homes who are exempted from the assessment. Uh, the rules with the, within this school district is that um, they have to have lived in the state for at least three years if they were not born in the United States um, in order to be required to take the English reading test. So there are, there are some children who were Spanish speaking and deaf and hard of hearing who um, did not take these English tests because they didn't have the proficiency. Um, and so you can see here, there are gains in the proficient and advanced. Most of the gains for this group of non-English speaking children is in the partially proficient area. But there are huge gains also in the unsatisfactory group. Um, there's also a huge gain in the number of children who took the test from only two in 2000 to 39 in 2013, 2014. Now, we were also able to compare children with hearing loss only versus children with multiple disabilities. The children with multiple disabilities were, had milder disabilities because um, hearing loss was judged to be the primary disability with this population. So if they had an intellectual disability that was more significant than the hearing loss, they would not have been in the study. If they were autistic um, and that was judged to be the primary disability, they would not be in this particular study. Um, both the children with hearing loss only and the children with additional disabilities made significant gains by both the birth year and the grade. And there was no significant difference between the amount of gain when comparing the groups, indicating that the services, the extra services that the children were receiving for the other disability uh, was allowing them to make the same reading gains as the children who were not receiving extra services, extra special education services, because they had hearing loss only. Um, now, this finding is somewhat remarkable that children with a primary disability of deafness and hearing loss plus one or more additional disabilities are benefiting from universal newborn hearing screening pretty much to the same degree as children with hearing loss only. Um, and that we're extremely excited about. We're excited to see that earlier identification and universal newborn hearing screening has a positive impact on, on children living in poverty as well as children with multiple disabilities as well as children in either monolingual homes that are not English or multilingual homes. Now we also found a very interesting finding and that is that there was no significant difference between the bilateral mild moderate hearing loss children and the children with unilateral hearing loss. Now remember this is a um, sample of children that has a high poverty rate. And poverty has been found to be a predictor of outcomes for children with unilateral loss. Now, both the children with bilateral mild moderate hearing loss and the children with unilateral hearing loss had better reading scores than the children with bilateral severe to profound hearing loss. So degree of hearing loss uh, was a predictor for better language outcomes. I'm sorry, for better reading outcomes. Although when you look at the children who are not in poverty, almost all of them had age appropriate reading scores. Um, so the issue was not really degree of hearing loss for the children not in poverty. But the problem is, is that um, if you have poverty, plus you have a more than one language in the home, and then you also have a more significant hearing loss, all of those variables are going to depress the language and reading scores of, of children. Um, 
So one of the recommendations that we have from our universal newborn hearing screening program is that when, particularly when we have an at-risk population um, because of socioeconomics, those children should be considered for the same early intervention and special education services as those children with bilateral mild moderate hearing loss. The best way to support families who are racially ethnically diverse those with lower levels of education, those in non-English speaking homes, those who experience significant economic challenges, is to establish universal newborn hearing screening to meet 136. And if you um, have hospitals that are so efficient, they're meeting 136, striving to even provide faster services by meeting 123, meaning screened by one month, identified by two months, and in early intervention by three months is recommended. So just in summary, again, just when you're looking at these results, the impact of universal newborn hearing screening had long-term effect all the way through the school age population till graduation from high school with the children becoming more and more proficient every grade of school. And, um, fewer and fewer of them being unsatisfactory when compared with their typically developing peers. Um, and I just want to thank the funding agencies for the research that we have been able to um, conduct, especially the parents, families, and children who have participated over this time period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for that informative session and for giving us such a broad perspective about hearing impairment in special education. Thank you, Madam.